nice to see that Dick's feeling a little bit better. It's a shame that Peggy is sick. Um, it's nice to be able to, to say that I was able to fill in for Dick for once. Uh, he's usually the guy that fills in for me if, if, uh, if I'm down and out, but uh, glad to, to see him back. Last week, we started a lesson, the New Testament Hall of Fame. The, the main idea behind it was Bible study. Um, it wasn't so much at random, but what I've done is I, I picked a verse or passage from each book of the New Testament that had a, had a tremendous message and linked together, they kind of told a story. And these aren't the only verses. These are verses that in in my study, kind of jumped out at me. The point behind this is to encourage and, and hopefully push us all to be more studious in the Bible. Um, our, our scripture reading today that Sam read is taken from 2 Timothy it's not on the outline. I used the same outline from, from last week. But our scripture reading was 2 Timothy 2.15. Um, this is the new, I use the new King James Version. But the King James Version starts out study instead of be diligent. The be diligent kind of describes how to study. But it says, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That only comes through study. You can't put the Bible under your pillow, and in the morning, while you're sleeping, it just kind of oozes into you. You, you, you got to open it. You got to... You got to look. And my challenge, anybody got a glove that I could throw down? My challenge to you is this year, let's become better students of the word. And, and I know, I, I know Jesus said the things you do don't do it to sound a trumpet and stuff like this. But just between me and you, I would like to know how your study goes through the year, how you're doing. It doesn't have to be a public thing of, you know, tooting a horn, waving a flag and all this stuff. Just, I'm curious. Tell me how you're doing with your study. How you're doing? We talked last week. There, there's so many different ways you can just start reading the Bible. You know, um, Sue and and Travis Wheeler um, gifted our congregation with a year subscription for th those little booklets that are out in the foyer. Power for today, which is a nice little devotional book. Many of you have notebooks. You know, just a, a simple 88-cent notebook from Walmart. Some of you divided up faith, salvation, things like that, and, and, and you write different verses down that have to do with those issues. Some of you mark up your Bibles, put stickers in it. They, And, and so forth. That's what that God's word, to, to, to make it mean something to you. We had left off last week um, with the book of Colossians. And so we are going to start with the book of First Thessalonians today and finish up. Again, these are not randomly picked. 
All scripture is inspired by, by God. But these are verses or passages that have jumped out at me. You might have, as you study different books, you might have different verses that jump out at you. But Paul wrote to the Christians in Thessalonica, he says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks. Not just the things that go your way. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What a, what a message there. Now, verse 14 and 15 had just as inspired words, but this is a verse that I chose out of 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And to give you who are troubled, he just mentioned rejoice always. Pray. And now in 2 Thessalonians, and to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing for those of you who are troubled about things. Is there any of us that don't have a few issues going on that are troubling us? Paul is reminding them, you remember, God's on your side. And, and when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, coming with his mighty angels, he's coming with vengeance. Flaming fire on two kinds of people. Those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus. He's, he's going to come and he's going to rectify all of those things. Oh, you know, God, why is all this happening? Why is, he's going to show the good guys win. And he's going to make it very clear. In 1 Timothy, he writes to his beloved Timothy in verses 3 and 4, that God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God is not taking pleasure in sending that vengeance to the earth. But God is just. God cannot let sin go unpunished. But he desires all men to be saved. Doesn't mean that they will be. Narrow is the gate. But he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How do you come to the knowledge of the truth? God's word. You study God's word. In 2 Timothy, Paul reminded Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed. It's, it's not people's opinion. It's not Paul just writing things down from Paul's mind or Peter writing things down from Peter or John. Or, it's from God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable 
for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17 explains why that the man of God and women, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what the word of God does for us. That's why he wants us to study to show ourselves approved, to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. It's not from man. It's from God. To Titus, he wrote, and he's writing to us, ultimately. They pr profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Oh, I'm a Christian. I know God. I follow God. But their works deny him. They're, they're saying one thing and doing another. Being abominable disobedient and disqualified for every good work. Our local track star, Marion, it's been a couple of years, but our local track star, if you're running a race and you're the fastest one out there, everybody knows it. But you break the rules, you are disqualified. You step on the line, you impede a runner, you, you jump just, just a little bit before the gun goes off. You're disqualified. Everybody knows you're going to run the race. You're the best. But you're disqualified. People profess to say they know God, but their works disqualify them, being, being an abomination to God. To Philemon, he's writing and he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers who demonstrate through their works that they're followers. He calls them out by name. Epaphras is a fellow prisoner of mine. He just doesn't say he's a Christian. He's a fellow prisoner with me. Do you doubt my service to God? Brother Epaphras as, and, and all these others greet you, my fellow laborers. They're not saying one thing and doing another. In Hebrews, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, this book starts out explaining God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Sunday morning we've been, been studying um, in Preston's class about the minor prophets. Preston made the comment today, you know, being one of the prophets wasn't a desirable, uh, a desirable thing. Going to people that don't want to hear what you've got to say were treated, mis mistreated, you know, laughed at, scorned, physically abused. God's used various ways, but the thing is, God has always revealed himself. Always. Whether it's verbally talking to somebody or appearing in a vision or a dream or a burning bush, God has never 
required anything of us that he didn't tell us about to begin with. He just didn't plop us down here and say, good luck, you're on your own. Figure it out. He's given us that word. And the word today for us in these last days is through his word, Jesus Christ. And we've got that word if we'll listen to it. In James, kind of tying in the saying one thing and doing another, James wrote, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Going back to, to a few verses ago where they profess to know God, but their works say otherwise. James is reinforcing that idea. The Apostle Peter is encouraging the brothers and sisters. He said, and he's reminding them, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The God who doesn't want any to perish. We are his special people, those that diligently follow him. And in 2 Peter, Chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, Peter says, as all, talking about the Apostle Paul, making reference to his writings, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, again, inspiration, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. They profess to know God. They'll pick bits and pieces it's like going to the old first cafeteria. I want some of this, some of this. Ooh, I don't want any of that. God's word is not a buffet. We can't have a heap and helping plate full of one thing and leave out the others that we don't want. Goes on to say, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware, lest you fall also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow. I've read the Bible once, got it all figured out, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in that knowledge. In 1 John, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, 
cleanses us from all sin. When we stumble, when we stumble, Emily, when we stumble, Jeff, when we stumble, Bruce, if we're walking in the light, we have the fellowship with each other. And the blood of his son continues to cleanse us if we're walking in the light. But if we start getting off the path, getting into the darkness, we don't have... What's the flip, what's the flip side of this? If we're walking in the darkness, we don't have fellowship with each other, and the blood doesn't cleanse us. If, if we purposefully leave that light. In 2 John 9 through 11, John says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Don't throw songbooks at me. I'm just reading it. It's pretty black and white. Whoever transgresses and does not abide. Abide is live. If you're staying in the doctrine of, if you're not staying in the doctrine of Christ, you do not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. We cannot condone sin. We cannot condone false doctrine. Because if we do, we're participating in it. We're allowing it. We're giving it the right hand of fellowship. Now, we've got to go into the world to take the gospel to people. But we can't accept those false teachings and allow it and to condone it. That's what John is saying. Third John, he writes, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, not his biological children, the children, the brethren that he's influenced, the people that, that the Apostle John has had an impact on. He dearly loves him. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Jude, not only walk in the truth, but we have to contend for it. Sometimes we have to fight for it. It's not an attitude of, well, you believe that, I believe this, you know, it all works out in the end, it'll all come out in the wash. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And the last book in the Bible, last book in the New Testament, Revelation 2.10. Jesus, through the Apostle John, was giving this inspiration to John, and some bad things were, were happening in the Roman Empire. Things were turning bad for the Christians. And he says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful 
until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Not be faithful until something doesn't go your way. Be faithful until you don't get the promotion at work that you wanted. And some other lame brain got it. And you just throw your hand, ah, I prayed for that promotion. Don't be faithful until a dear loved one passes away. And then all bets are off. Why did you do that, God? Don't be faithful until you, you suffer a financial setback. And things are a little rough. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Brings us back to our to our scripture and the whole I guess the whole point of last week and this week's sermon is to study. Study God's word. These were just some verses that had that kind of jumped out at me. I want to know what verses jump out at you. They're not going to jump out at you if you don't open it up. Okay? And if they do jump out without you opening it up, I want to hear that. <clears throat> but Paul told Timothy, be diligent. King James, study to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The lesson is yours. We're at the beginning of a brand new sparkling new year study. And I want to know how your studies go. It doesn't, we're not going to broadcast it. But I would like to know how it goes. So, so let me know. Okay? Let me know if you need a little encouragement. Let me know if you need a swift kick in the backside to get studying more. Because I can do both, okay? Anyway, the lesson is yours. Um, if you need to respond to the invitation through baptism, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. If you need to be baptized, if you need prayers of the congregation, if, if you're visiting and would like to identify as working and worshiping with us here at South Valley, if you're already a member of the Lord's Church, you're not joining us. You're just saying you want to worship here. We don't add you to the Lamb's Book of Life. The Lord does that when you're baptized. But if you'd like to identify with us here, uh, we would love to have you. Whatever your need, please come forward while Don leads us in the invitation song. Let's stand and sing, please. Some glad when this life is o'er, I'll fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, bye. This life of gold, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by Stuff.